just to remind you that we have three months for you to learn that bass part, guys. That, uh, <laughs> so just, you know, something to work on in your free time. <laughs> just, uh, I just think that would be great to hear all of that. But I, it's great, bass or tenor or no, uh, it's great to hear the people of God sing. And some of you make uh, a noise that's more joyful than, you know, melodious. And uh, the Lord loves a cheerful giver of song, right? A giver of praise. And so praise God for all of you who sing. And, uh, and thank you for praising God uh, in that singing. I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church this morning. Uh, glad to have you with us. And we want to start things off right with a word of prayer. So Rob, would you come and offer the Lord our thanks and praise and uh, bring a few requests before him. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to welcome all of our new visitors that's uh, here today. And that stuff, uh, I want to let you know that we pray for you guys every day that we have new visitors. Yeah. But uh, one of our uh, members of the church is uh, pretty ill. That's Marlene. Um, right now, she is in a long-term care facility waiting to have, I believe, her gallstones removed and that stuff. So let's pray for her also. And Lord, uh, also this last Tuesday, we had uh, um, what is called the Shield 616 Project. It's for our deputy sheriffs, our, our policemen in the town, where um, people got together and bought them um, special uniforms, uh, bulletproof vests, helmets, and, and the like, and that stuff, Lord. And uh, it's been three years already since that's happened. So um, we just want to thank you for the people who donated to that program also and that and uh, deputies that we talked to are really appreciative of what they received so let's go to prayer Lord again we lift up our voice to you we want to thank you so much for hearing our prayers Lord um, if uh, Jesus prayed to you how much more important it is for us to pray to you but Lord, we, uh, we do lift up Marlene to you, Lord. We pray for a quick recovery from this. We pray that she'll be able to get in and have her operation so she can get back on the men, get back uh, back into Park Rapids, Lord. So we pray for her, Lord. And Lord, we also pray, pray for our policemen, our sheriff's department, our deputies, our EMTs, our nurses, everybody that's on the front line, Lord. May you just protect them and, and just bless them. But Lord, we just want to ask that you bless this service. We lift up our prayers to you, Lord. Um, we just uh, pray that we are attentive this morning to your word. May we be doers of your word, Lord. And Lord, as we take the Lord's Supper today, let us uh, examine ourselves and, and have a clean heart before we go taking, uh, taking the elements. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Stay standing, please. Let's sing number 377. 377. Let's sing our resurrection song. Number 377, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior. Number 377.
ever cared for me like Jesus did. Let's sing all three verses of 362. No one ever cared for me like Jesus did.
that they have a family who loves them, brothers and sisters in Christ. And God, give them strength and endurance to do your will. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, a few announcements. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm part three of my series on fear. Um, just talking about fear. And next week, we'll talk more about anxiety. But tonight, we'll talk about kind of the reactions that we have to fear and why is, why is it that we're so afraid of so many things. And so biblically, we're going to be looking at the story in Numbers 13 and 14. And uh, looking at that tonight, to join us at 6 o'clock, we also have um, uh, time of trivia. And, and it's, it's fun on Sunday nights. Um, more directly, we have the Lord's Supper this morning. If you're not, uh, you weren't planning on it, you maybe didn't know or forgot from last week, uh, I still would invite you to just consider that we're taking the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, or Communion, however you want to call it, uh, together this morning. The Bible says, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but the Bible says that uh, before you, that this is a sacred thing. It's, it's not a means of salvation. It's not even a means of grace, but it is a sacred thing. And so we would invite you to examine your, your heart to see if uh, this is something you should partake in or not. You don't have to. Uh, you can let the plate go by, but it is a celebration of the Lord, Lord's death. And uh, so those who know Christ because we have been saved by his shed blood, uh, you can partake. Uh, those of you who are uh, availing of yourself of the blood of Christ to forgive your sins, uh, you can take that. If you're this morning... Uh, you're not sure if you if you were to die today whether or not you go to heaven. Not only do we want you to know that for certain, but we would ask you just to let that plate pass by. Um, if there are same things in your life where you're saying, I'm just not willing to confess that to the Lord, I'm not willing to repent of it, I'm hanging on to that, well, how can you celebrate the shed blood of Christ that washes away your sin if you're also holding on to that sin? I'm not saying you have to be perfect or sinless in order to take it. Nobody would. I couldn't give it out. But what I'm saying is that if you this morning are... Are, there's something where you're, I am unwilling to forgive, I'm unwilling to repent, I'm unwilling to say, God, that, that's a, the, to agree with God. Let me just encourage you to pass that plate by as it goes, okay? So and this, is, uh, this is a serious thing that the Lord has instructed that we take. And so we'll do that at the very end of the service before our last hymn. Um, this coming Wednesday, we're in, back in Psalms, and we're in Psalm 67 this coming Wednesday night. And then this coming Saturday, I know there was some confusion, but this coming Saturday, uh, August 21st, we're having a memorial service for Sister Pat Henderson. Uh, Al will be back on Thursday, and uh, his family, some of her family will be here. We do need some help with that, and you can talk to Noy about uh, how much help she needs for that. We do need some help, but uh, more than anything, Al would just love to have some of his church family here with him. And, uh, and so he's going to be playing again. Uh, we're just going to have a, a good time with uh, uh, getting, getting reconnected with him, but of course then saying uh, goodbye to Sister Pat. So that's this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock. There will be a lunch to follow. Um, and then we do have a church picnic coming up, so usually at the end of August. Not only do we have a birthday anniversary fellowship, uh, which, Rebecca, this is going to be a celebration of your birthday, in case we hadn't said yet. But, uh, <laughs> generally, what we do is we have uh, a tent. We'll put a tent out there, and we'll have everything outside, and uh, so pray for good weather, and then it won't be uh, sweltering hot. Uh, you, could, of course, can eat inside, but it's kind of just fun to have a picnic. Wouldn't it be fun if that's the Sunday that you decide to invite some friends to come to church, okay? Yeah. If, I, if I know that we're going to have a lot of people, and especially people that aren't part of our church or who know Christ as Savior, I would love to preach a salvation message to your loved ones so they can hear the gospel and be saved. So make that an evangelistic outreach, but uh, we won't be having a, a picnic right after the service. Um, don't bring, like, a lasagna uh, or, I mean, not not saying ever. I'm saying for this Last one, we're going to have hot dogs and, and uh, tube steaks, and uh, so we'll have that. Hot dogs. Uh, hamburgers and hot dogs, we'll have uh, those. And so you just bring a side salad of some kind or a dessert or something, so uh, that'll be in a couple of weeks. All right, uh, I think that's everything. Ushers, would you come forward, please, to take up our offering? Thanks to everybody who's been so faithful in giving. And uh, give now this morning, free will and, uh, and cheerful. For the rest, can ask you to ask Lord, bless you. Lord, thank you so much for dying on the cross for us, Lord God. We can never outgive you. Lord, I just pray you bless each and every giver here, a cheerful giver, Lord, and that we just use this uh, 
as we take in, Lord, we honor and glorify everything you want us to do. In Jesus' name I ask these things. come September 5th, and so we need some help, and I appreciate everybody who's been willing to help with that. There's a sign-up sheet on the back. I also want to thank Noi for all the work that she puts into every morning, yeah. making coffee and treats and everything in between services. Uh, if you're not the kind of person that comes early enough to church or for Sunday school and you miss that, then you're missing it, okay? So I just want to encourage you. Let me encourage you, first of all, to come to Sunday school, and then second of all, if you really can't get up at... Uh, Eight in order to be here by 9:30, then uh, at least come a little bit early and go back and fellowship in the uh, in the area back there. Have some coffee and some treats. You know, it's a lot of work into that. I am starting a new series on salvation this morning. We just talked about why it's important to study that, and we're going to be talking about every little bit that we can about that uh, about salvation and the doctrine. So let me encourage you to come to Sunday school. Anyway, uh, be praying as we reach out to the uh, children that we had come through BBS, that we get a lot of those children here. Let's sing again, number 417, number 417, It Is Well With My Soul. Stay seated, if you would, as we sing verses 1. Uh, let's sing all four verses of It Is Well With My Soul.
my faith won't be faith anymore. It'll be sight. Let's see verse 4. And life is the
There's a red pew Bible there that's uh, on page 698. And if you don't know where Psalms is, somewhere around the middle of the Bible there. And while you're looking for that, Psalm 105, uh, I'd encourage you to... I can't see. One's online, and, and if, uh, one's here. We come earlier to hear this about the salvation. It's going to be a, a lengthy thing, but it's really interesting laying the ground so far. But I'd encourage you to come and hear it. Okay, Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O oh, ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all in, are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Thank you. You may be seated. Children, you're dismissed for children's church ages 4 to 4th grade. So Jake, enjoy it while it lasts. And we're going to go through Jeremiah 32. Uh, as the children are leaving, I'll just admit that uh, I'm at the part in Jeremiah that I was wondering if I would struggle with. Huh. Uh, meaning this, that there's a lot that's starting to sound the same, and I'm going to start maybe sounding like I'm re-preaching messages. And uh, so anytime, uh, anytime a pastor, I'll just you know give you like a, into my heart, anytime a pastor comes to a theme or a passage that seems familiar, there's always this desire to make it seem fresh and make it just not the same thing that you say every week. Some pastors start to sound the same, and no matter what they're preaching, they're going to say pretty much the same thing. And part of that's just personality. You can't get away from the way that you put things. But some of it, and some of it's laziness. Pastors just want to preach the same message, and so they don't put a lot into it. But some of it, like with Jeremiah, there's just a lot of things that start to sound the same. And so uh, there's that struggle that I want to put some kind of new twist on it. Uh, and by twist, that's a pretty dangerous thing to do, right? The Bible is pretty explicit about not twisting scripture. And uh, so I, I struggle sometimes with making the application uh, and some of the things that we've done, especially application that we haven't made before. And uh, so this week, I feel like it's going to be a little more of a devotional thought. I'm going to go through the passage and make a few ending uh, applications as best I can. I'm praying really that the Lord would use this in your heart, in your life, uh, personally. That what he says would be, and this is true every week, but especially this week, that what he says would come through more than what I have to say. And that you would really commune with the Lord as I'm preaching. That it wouldn't just be about listening with these ears, but that you would really listen with with the spiritual ears that God's given you. So to that end, that that might happen, and that you might get something out of a message that's going to sound the same, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the book of Jeremiah. Thank you not only that you've given us the Word, and that you've given it to us in our language, that we can understand it, but that you've also then given us spiritual ears to hear it. We understand that the Bible says the natural or unsaved man cannot receive the things of God, the foolishness unto him. But to us who are saved, Lord, these things are uh, supernaturally empowered. And so, Lord, banking on that promise, hoping on that promise, we want you to speak here today. We want this morning to hear from you. And so, Lord, let that be, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus, in his ministry, talked about the days before Noah's flood. He said in Matthew 24, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying 
and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the implication is that the flood came upon them suddenly, that they were doing things that people normally do, nothing wrong with eating, nothing wrong with drinking, depending on what you're drinking, nothing wrong with getting married, depending on who you're getting married to, you know, and so uh, there's a lot of different things that they were doing, they're just normal things, not necessarily simple things, just things that they were doing, but they had no reference to what God was doing, despite the fact that Noah preached, listen, for a hundred years. I mean, Noah did not give one sermon that just happened to not get to everybody. You know, if what... Well, I, I tend to believe that there was kind of one continent, so it's not like people were spread out so, so far uh, at that time. And then in 100 years, everybody could have heard there's this guy building an ark saying that God's going to destroy the earth with the flood. But anyway, despite all that, they lived their lives with no reference to God at all, and they didn't believe Noah's preaching. Now, it would be reasonable that if you understood a coming danger, that you would make changes. That you would, if you knew that there was something coming, the Bible says, a prudent man perceiveth the evil and hideth himself, but it's the simple pass on and are punished. It's prudent if you know that there's something wrong coming, that you would do something about that. We think about, um, and, and it's it, interesting when people don't make those correlations. For instance, when we watched back in 2005, Hurricane Katrina flooding the city of New Orleans, and some people, in their desperation to get away from the city, had to bring color TVs with them. That they didn't pay for, you know, yeah. for walking out of stores with yeah. 24 packs of beer, and it's like, how is that going to help you get out of the city? Yeah. You know, why would you be doing that now of all times? Well, you know why they're doing it because there's no one there to stop them, right? You think about Lot's wife; the city is going to be destroyed, and she could not stop but look back, and was destroyed uh, with the city because she would not go. She she didn't. Take into consideration that the end is near. And Christians, we understand that the end is some time. I think most of us understand, I mean, honestly, just chronologically, we understand that the end is nearer than it was 2,000 years ago, but we see the signs of the times and we say, it's got to be coming up pretty quick here, right? It's got to be the end. There is an end. And, and, and you might say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be raptured before the bad stuff happens. Well, you might be raptured before the really, really bad stuff happens, but you know that a lot of other things could happen before Christ comes back. Yeah. There are brothers and sisters all over the world that are suffering right now, and they're not hoping for the rapture to rescue them. They're, they're still living in day-to-day -day what they're living in. And so I'm not saying the rapture is not going to happen. I, I'm not setting dates either. But what I'm saying is that um, we're here right now looking at the end, and so what should we do about that? Um, we should live in such a way that would reflect the fact that we see that there's something coming. And that's part of the confusion that Jeremiah has with our passage. We'll talk about this. But I'd like to reference a passage of scripture that is just really, really helpful, especially in light of end times. It's 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12. And, it, and there it says this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And again, the idea that's a picture that Jesus used often, a thief does not say, hey, uh, don't be home at midnight on uh, August 20th because I'm going to rob your house. He comes unannounced and at a time when you wouldn't expect him. So he says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then it says, we, so we know this as Christians. And then it says, seeing that then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy that in all holy conversation and godliness? Right? What does that mean? And since you know that the end is coming, man, doesn't that just make you want to be more holy? Doesn't that want to make you just draw closer to Christ? Now some Christians are like, ah. Uh, yeah, no, that's the right answer for sure. You know, that's the Sunday school answer. Be like Jesus? Yes, right. But that's what God expects Christians to have, the mindset that as, as we see what's going on in the world around us, that we would say, boy, now more than ever, we want to be like Jesus Christ. We want to walk in holiness. He goes on to say, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. He says, again, just the idea is, if you know this is coming, 
And then today's the day you ought to walk with God. Today's the day that you ought to uh, make those things right. Today's the day that you ought to uh, live by faith and learn how to do that. So that's going to be largely my application. So looking at Jeremiah chapter 32 then, um, Jeremiah is living in the last days of Jerusalem. Uh, notice there's a little chronological marker here, and I'll talk about that as we read through it. Verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, now, Zedekiah reigned eleven years, and then he was uh, taken, captured. We'll read about this later on in the book of Jeremiah. His eyes were put out right after he saw his sons killed, and he was carted off to Babylon where he died. So he's got a year left, or maybe less. So it's the end. It's the end. It's coming. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. Why? For Zedekiah the king of Judah had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah king of Judah shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. So verses um, 3, the second part, 4 and 5, are what Jeremiah said. And because of that, Zedekiah the king put him in prison. He didn't like that Jeremiah was saying that God's going to give the city of Jerusalem over to Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, so he's put in prison. Now, notice in verse number 2 that the king of Babylon is already outside. He's besieging the city of Jerusalem. So their days are numbered, but they're hoping that God will deliver them. And again, that's despite the fact that Jeremiah has been prophesying, God will not deliver you. He'll deliver you into the hand of the king of Babylon, not out of the king, the hand of the king of Babylon. So he's put in prison there, and he gets a word from God while he's in prison, that a relative will come and ask him to buy a field. So it's kind of just this anomaly, right? It's just you're watching a TV show and all of a sudden some random person shows up and you're like, this has to do something with something, right? Like, what is, what is going on here? I don't understand this. And so you get this little picture and, and the rest of the chapter is, what just happened? What is this all about? Verse 6, and Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Ham." Hanameel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field, that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanameel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the right and the redemption is thine, buy it for thyself. Now he maybe wouldn't have done anything about it, but God had said, so then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Hanameel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even seventeen shekels of silver, and I subscribed the evidence, and sealed it, and took witnesses, and weighed him in the money, him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed, according to the law and custom, and that which was open. All right, now let me just stop there. So God says, hey, your cousin is coming tomorrow. God doesn't say it like that. But God says, your cousin is coming tomorrow. There's a field that you actually are next in line to inherit, by the way that the law goes. And uh, he wants you to buy it, so buy it. And sure, sure enough, here comes Shalom, or uh, Hanameel, the son of Shalom, his uncle. And says, i got this field. You're next in line. Would you like to buy it? If you don't, I will. And... So Jeremiah says, okay, I'll buy it. 17 shekels of silver. They get up the scales. They put the weights, and he gets the 17 shekels. And then Jeremiah gets the deed, as it were, the, the piece of paper that's open that says to everybody, now Jeremiah owns this, and uh, the little envelope, you know, the little sealed one that would go in the courts that would say, I, I now own this piece of property. So again, you're in jail, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, you're in jail for preaching the gospel. Here you are, and uh, you get a call from someone on the outside, and they say, uh, hey, I'm selling my new car. Would you like to buy it? You're there in prison saying, I'm sorry, I have more important things right now. <laughs> this is kind of a bad time for this. What, what is going on? But God had said, he's coming, and so buy this land from him. Right? You're reading through the Bible, and you get to this part, and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. 
And uh, neither did Jeremiah. So then we continue. Verse 13, I charge Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, that they may, be, they may continue many days. So hide this, put it away, put it in a safe deposit box, as it were, so it can continue, so that days later people can find this. Why? Verse 15, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Oh, okay, so it's supposed to be a sign. It's a sign that eventually people will be doing that very thing, buying vineyards again. Even though at this point it doesn't seem like that's ever going to happen again. All the other cities in Judah have been taken. Jerusalem's the only one left, and it's surrounded by Chaldeans. And it doesn't look good for them. And so God's, in a way, giving this sign, one day this will be happening, regular transactions, regular moving around. So, you know, it's, again, today, today's vernacular, there will be a day when you will, one of these days, sometime in the future, you'll go a whole day without hearing the word COVID. <coughs> Oh. Yeah. Even so, let that be, right? Yeah. But right now, it seems like this is what we're going to talk about forever. Right? 30 years from now, people are going to be saying, oh, have you heard about the Zeta variant? You know, and it's just going to be Anyway, so, Jeremiah does it. He pronounces the sign, houses are going to be possessed. And then Jeremiah has a, has a conversation with God, like, what is this? What is this about? I don't understand why you would have me do this. And so he says in verse 16, Now when I deliver the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed unto the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest loving kindness in the thousands, and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers and the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, it is, is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open unto all the ways of the sons of men to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and hast made thee a name as at this day. Thou hast brought forth thy people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders and with a strong hand, with a stretched out arm and with great terror, and hast given them this land which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and possessed it, but they obeyed not thy voice, neither walked in thy law. They have done nothing of all that thou hast commandest them to do. Therefore thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. Behold the mounts, or the hills that the Babylonians are making outside. They're, they're bringing great earthen piles so they can go over the walls. Look at the mounts. I mean, this is imminent. They're right outside. Behold the mounts. They're come unto the city to take it. And the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans that fight against it because of the sword and the famine and the pestilence. And what thou hast spoken has come to pass. Behold, thou seest it. And thou hast said unto me, O Lord God, Buy thee the field for money and take witnesses, for the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. So do you hear what Jeremiah is saying? All right, God, from, from past, you're the mighty God. And what he says is as poetic as any of the Psalms. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful hymn of praise. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he says, God, you've done all this, and you told us that we should obey, and we didn't. So now you brought the king of Babylon to us. Where does this fit in? I don't understand this whole buying the land, the field thing. What, what am I doing with this? It seems like you're going to destroy everything, and yet you wanted me to make this sign of hope? Why is there hope here? So let's look at Jeremiah's praise to God. He, he says that God is a creator, that he's powerful, that he's lovingly kind, that he's just, that he's great, that he's mighty, that he's the captain of the hosts of heaven. So Jeremiah fully knows who God is. He fully understands the power of God to do whatever God wants. And God, he says, has proven himself in Egypt. He's rescued them from the Egyptians, and he's given them the promised land. So I just think, first of all, by way of occupation, there are questions. God, why are you doing this? I don't understand. You know, like, why are you allowing all these things to happen? I know the end has to come, but does it have to come in such a terrible manner? Like, does the country that we love have to be so torn apart? Because what Jeremiah was asking, that's what we're asking. Is this the way, why is this, what is going on here? I think all of our questions should start with praise. Just a, a fundamental understanding that God in the heavens does whatever is good. Good for him, which then, as we align with him, is good for us. 
of God is good and start with that premise. It grounds our confusion in truth and what we know about God. And it starts with a heart that wants to honor God instead of demanding an answer. That's the problem with Job, right? Job started to uh, scrut the inscrutable. <laughs> he started to look into things that were not his business. And of course, were way below his pay grade. So at some point he says, if God were here, I would demand him an answer. And then God shows up. And Job doesn't have very much to say. Uh, the heart of praise understands that though we have questions of, of God, that our questions are respectful and loving. And, and the question that a loving son would ask a, a loving father and not um, a criminal would ask a police officer. Right? That's what we're looking at here. It also reminds us of our submission to him. And when you... Um, will learn to have a heart of praise and submission to God in praise and in recognition of his goodness, then uh, that will be a, a start in answering the questions about what in the world is going on. What, what is happening to us? Because it starts with a relationship with God. It starts with a, a loving understanding of who God is. Now we generally assume the best in daily life, right? You see someone who's a cashier and uh, he doesn't have a very shiny demeanor. You assume they're just probably having a bad day after the bad Hopefully you as a Christian wouldn't be rude to that person because they're not everything they should be. Um, hopefully you would have grace for that person. If you're missing a letter, you assume that it's the fault of the postal service and not that someone's stealing your mail. When I worked for the postal service, we had people come in and say, like people that were not mentally stable, like clinically not mentally stable, coming in and saying, where's my check? You people are stealing my check. You know, it's like we're looking around the floor. I don't see anything for you. There's nothing here. We don't assume the worst about each other, but somehow we can do that with God. And what Jeremiah starts with is, God, I know that you're good. I know that you are powerful. You can do whatever you want. I'm trying to figure out, you've already pronounced judgment on the city. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. Why why you're doing this and, and what all of this means. So Jeremiah's recognition that something is broken. He says in verse 23 that Israel did not obey, that they've been fighting against God, and the reason that they're suffering is, has largely to do with their disobedience. It's not because God's a bad God. It's because God's lovingly chided them and begged them and encourage them to come back to him. And they just haven't done it. They've killed the prophets. They sawed Isaiah in half. And here they put Jeremiah in prison. Like they're not listening. And Jeremiah understands that's, that's what's going on. The punishment is not far off. But the mountains are right outside. And again, it's just good to recognize. To, to take the focus off. Let the world say a good and loving God wouldn't da 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 da. Let's just recognize that we're living in a broken world and that we want a God who's going to make all the brokenness right and fix it. Now, whether he does that in every specific situation or not is up to God. Many of that you recognize that he has. There are things in your life that, that have been broken and God has put back together. Praise God for that. As you live in praise, you remember those things. Jeremiah has remembered the times that God has brought Israel back and showed such kindness, undeserved kindness to them. And, uh, and Jeremiah draws on that knowledge of what God's done. Man, you, you took care of us in Egypt. You brought us into this land, God. And we have totally broken our covenant relationship with you. This is our fault. Well, let me look at the world and the fact that it's going to pieces. We should recognize that this is because of us. This is because of what's in our hearts. That we're wicked and that we only want what's wrong. And God in his goodness has to do something about that. Um, the question is, why do you want me to talk about buying this land? There are, again, more important things about this. Uh, this land is not going to be worth very much. And again, I, I keep using this illustration because I, I have to think it's the only one that comes. We in America do not understand what an invading army would look like. Right? It's been 200 years, um, you know, since we, since uh, foreign uh, uh, ground troops were on our soil, 
you know, and, and even then it was the British. Uh, so it was like, I mean, these are people that were kind of just like us. And we haven't had anything like what Israel had where this total, total other culture comes so, but just try to imagine what it would be like if we went home this afternoon and foolishly turned on the television and found out that China has been invading America. They've already taken California. You know, take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're moving across, and, and here all of a sudden, you know, now we're, we're just watching the map as the Chinese army is taking over, and, and now they're in North Dakota and they're coming. And uh, you're thinking, like, no, this is unstoppable. And then somebody comes to your house and says, hey, I've got some land. Do you want to buy it? And you're like, no. What are you talking about? That land isn't going to be worth anything once the Chinese take it over. And I'm not trying to beat up on the Chinese. I'm just saying that's about, you know, if the Russians and the Chinese team up and they come across. I'm not even saying they will. I'm just trying to give you a picture for what this is, okay? <laughs> Our pastor, he's gone off the rails. He's been in Jeremiah just a little too long. I'm just trying to give you a picture of, like, this is the only conceivable situation that I can think of all of a sudden now. And here we are, and, and there's this marauding army you're watching, uh, you know, them come, and, and someone's coming and saying, oh, you know, I'd like, you would like to buy this, this stuff? And you're like, no. And someone comes to your house and says, would you like to buy this huge color TV? And you're like, why? So I can watch Chinese propaganda on it? I'm not interested. What's going on here? Don't you understand that there's like there's more important things than right now? And we as Christians get that, and we're so frustrated because we say, don't you see the end of what you're doing? And the answer is largely, no, people don't. We're in a war, and we're losing as a, as a country, as, as a world. I mean, you read the Re book of Revelation, and a lot has to happen between now and then to get the, to the place where they are in Revelation, and then it gets even worse. We understand the end of that. We understand the terminus. It's not open-ended for us. It's not an open world. Anything might happen. At the end, that is going to happen, and we understand that. And we're looking at this saying, don't you see? And the answer is no, they don't. They, I mean, there are people that honestly think that we can turn this ship around. And I'm, I am not here to set dates. I'm not here to, I'm just, I don't think we can. I think we as American Christians just have to understand that, that this is, we're on the Titanic. Okay? Right? I'm not trying to freak anybody out. I'm just saying, the sooner you come to grips with that, like Jeremiah did, like, let's see, God said, we're going to be surrounded. Like, he's been right ever since. And now Babylon's outside and there are mounts up against the city. What else? And God did. God said, I'm not going to deliver you. So Jeremiah's like, here we are. And yet God wants him to act like nothing's wrong. Go buy some land. And he said, what is going on here? I don't understand this. Are you changing your mind? Is that what you're saying? And so uh, God then answers him. That's what the rest of the chapter is about. Verse 26, then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord. You're right, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against the city shall come and set fire on this city and burn it with the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. For this city hath been to me as a provocation of my anger and of my fury from the day that they built it, even unto this day, that I should remove it from before my face. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everybody, Everybody, everybody has been angering me and provoking me. And they've turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house, in the temple, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire into Molech which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause you to sin. Jeremiah, you're absolutely right. I've seen everything you've seen and more. I know that I'm acting justly, and you're right, and you're welcome. I'm doing everything right. 
Because they have absolutely sinned. And we understand that. We've talked about much of this before, that God has good reasons. And we have no reason to question whether God will punish the United States of America or not. We have greater access to God's word. And yet, I don't know if there's ever been a people per capita who have neglected God's word more than America. Do we not deserve judgment? There are many more churches in America than anywhere else. And yet, we don't find churches evangelizing anybody. We don't find them preaching the true gospel. We don't find them caring about people. We don't find them... uh, We find a lot of consumerism in churches. They become just like the world, and churches often perpetuate their message so they can perpetuate themselves, not the gospel. Do we not deserve judgment? Do we not deserve judgment? In verse 35, he talks about the killing of innocent children, the killing of babies. Do we not deserve judgment for the sin of abortion in America? And it's not that that abortion has happened because of medical necessity or because of some of the trite reasons that people try. Most of abortions that have happened in America have been because of convenience. Really, that's what we mean when when, when people say choice. I want the choice to be convenienced instead of inconvenienced. And that, I think, is the worst thing about abortion in America, that it hasn't happened because it's been necessary, but because it's been desired. It's just... We, we have treated that which is precious as if it were vile. The word of God, church, innocent people, do we not deserve judgment? I mean, we can say God bless America, but why should he? Right? I mean, I'm, you can say God bless Israel, but at this moment, why should he? Now, here's the difference. God hasn't made any promises to America. And God made all kinds of promises to Israel. We have less hope than Jeremiah did. And, and God addresses that. This is, this is why. I told you to buy that land. It's a sign that someday I'm going to bring everybody back. In verse number 36, Now therefore thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel concerning the city, whereof ye say, ye say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in my great wrath. I'll bring them again into this place and will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I promised them. And this and fields shall be bought in this land, whereof ye shall say, it's a desolate without man or beast. It's given to the hand of the Chaldeans. Those lands, men shall buy fields for money, and subscribe evidences, and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, and in the cities of mountains, and in the cities of the valley, and in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. So again, there's hope. There's always hope. There's hope for Israel because God's made promises. can't make the same claim for us, so then where do we make some application? And just the few minutes I have, let me give some. Um, It would be good for you to learn to trust God now. To learn to walk by faith now. Right now you're not in a place where you desperately need to rely and lean on the Lord. Or at least you don't feel it as keenly. There's coming a day where you will. There's coming a day where you will need that faith. You'll need those faith muscles which right now you need to be exercising. I, uh, speaking of muscle, I, I started working out last October and uh, I just wanted to do it just for something to do and uh, not not just something to do, but something to, just to make me healthy. I'm in my 40s, and I'm like, let's get ahead of this rather than try to play catch up. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of improvement because you don't generally incrementally. But uh, when we went to put the fair together at the booth, and I could lift that ladder really easily, I was like, oh, oh, this is kind of nice that I can. <laughs> I'm not grunting and struggling under it, you know. And uh, there's coming a day you're going to have to do some heavy faith lifting, Amen. and you don't even know when that day is. 
And it may be that you need to strengthen the faith of other people, and you need to learn by, to live by faith today in little things, in daily things. You need to learn what it means that without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. And, and if you can learn that today, then you'll learn that dependence. It'll be there. You'll have enough saved up to be able to take from. That's the other thing I wanted to talk about is to the, 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 what Jeremiah did. He put 17 shekels toward this piece of land. If you know the rest of the story, Jeremiah is taken from the land. He's kidnapped and taken down to Egypt where he dies. So he doesn't even get to enjoy the land. That field that he bought, he put the receipt in a jar, put it underground, and later somebody else got to enjoy it. He didn't even get to enjoy it. But that was there as a sign to the people that came back that, I don't know if he put this chapter in there or something, but there was something that was a sign to future generations. So that tells me to try to, again, invest in what will go. You've heard this before. Uh, can't take it with you. There's a lot that you will not take to heaven with you. There are some things that you can take to heaven with you. Namely, other people. You can invest in the lives of the young people in our church, of other people in our church. You can talk to your neighbors, be a witness, be a testimony for Christ, to bring other people to Christ, so that you can have some kind of investment in people. And what Christ said is where your treasure is, is like to store up your treasure in heaven. Everything that you're spending all your time thinking about now, like 1 Peter or 2 Peter said, it's all going to burn up. It's going to melt away with the fervent heat. All the things that are so important to you are going to be nothing in just a short amount of time. And it's, it's always sad when people get that, you watch the lights come on on their deathbed. And it's like, man, if I could have gotten this 30 years ago. Well, here we are, maybe 30 years from your deathbed. Get it now. Right? Understand that there's an investment that you need to make in spiritual things and not be so focused on those other things. Jeremiah got it. He's like, why are we talking about this physical investment when there are spiritual things? Jeremiah got it. I wonder why we don't. We're just so in this world. The third uh, point of application I'll say is that hardships are a sign of future restoration. So the, the idea that for Jeremiah... This idea that the bouncer outside and that this is all coming. God says, yes, I'm going to scatter you, but the same God who scattered you in my wrath will bring you back in my love. So there's, there's, when we look at the book of Revelation, for instance, and see all the horrible things that happen, you know what that really is a picture of? The fact that God loves enough to restore. And then what we're seeing now in, in our country and the world around us all the wickedness and the hatred for things that are good, that, that makes me want and desire Christ to come back and fix everything even more. You know the last words of Revelation? Not the last words, but some of the last words, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Like, you read the book of Revelation, and aren't you just like, oh, I hope he comes back soon. <laughs> you know, my favorite part is Revelation 19, when Christ comes back. And isn't it true that living in this world makes you just really, really want the next? Amen. Yeah. So that's a sign. It's a sign for us that God is working. And uh, keeping that perspective, I feel like, is important. I think that's part of what Jeremiah is talking about here in this purchase in the middle of a siege. It doesn't seem right. It seems like this is kind of silly. God's got good things that he wants to do in the siege. And uh, by God's grace, we'll learn those lessons and, and get that. God, help us, please, Lord, as we approach the days. Uh, Lord, however soon they are, however far off they are, Lord, we are praying. We pray on a regular basis on Wednesday night that you would send us revival, that you'd have mercy on us and uh, spare us. And so, Lord, uh, if it be your will, Lord, to send a revival that many would come to know Christ, Lord, we would, we would love that. We believe that's your heart. Lord, whether you do or don't, we trust you to do what's right and what's good and what's loving. Help us, Lord, to invest in the future, to treasure in heaven, to understand that uh, these things just make us a little more homesick for heaven. And uh, so, Lord, help us in understanding these things to make this a part of not just a Sunday morning thought, but a walk of life and a practice. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.